Let's pray another short prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we often come to church and we hear a lot of words. We read the pages from your book, the Bible. The pastor preaches from the pulpit or from the floor an exposition of the Word of God, yet sometimes we just don't get it. We don't see your Son, the Lord Jesus, the Word come down from heaven who lives and dwells amongst us, who chides us gently about our sins, brings us to repentance, and abides for us grace and complete forgiveness on the cross of Calvary. Take our liturgical services, our reading and preaching of the word, our attendance here to draw closer to your Son, the Lord Jesus, who is present in the preaching, who is present in the sacrament, of the table who is present at the waters of baptism and give us life. In his name we pray, amen. Early is important. Early, E-A-R-L-Y. Early is important. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. The proverb of that is start your day early and achieve a lot and enjoy the fruits of your labor. If Wyatt here, who goes to high school, is told by a science teacher, you need to have a project by February 15th, it would be wise of Wyatt to start early. Not on the evening of the 14th, but to start today. If you have a big project at home, it's best to start early. To chip away at it instead of waiting for all the work to descend upon you at a time when there's short time. I've noticed that when people start jobs, it's the, it's the smart ones. When they start a job, a, they get there on time and immediately they show that they are good workers that they're good workers. They don't wait a day or two or three. They show initiative and they start their work immediately and maybe even early on they'll go to the boss and say, what else can I do? And they build up a trust relationship with the boss. This guy is a good worker. I don't have to supervise him so close. I can give him work, her work, and I'm sure it'll get done. What did Jesus do early in his ministry? That's important. It's especially important this year because the epiphany season, the season that gives us the list of things that Jesus does and declares himself as the Son of God, and we can count on him, is rather short. It ends two weeks from today. All the remnants of Christmas end two weeks from today. All the glow and the joy of Christmas and the holidays in come to a screeching halt on February 10th when we enter into the season of Jesus' passion and suffering on behalf of us. So we're still kind of enjoying the excitement of the arrival of the birth of Jesus, and we're looking at what he does early. He's on the job. And what does he go after early? Does he get to work? Does he think about you and me? Does he take on projects that help us get right with God? It starts early when the wise men come from a long ways away to visit the child, Jesus. He's still a child, and there's a message about who he is. He's not just for this small country called Israel and Judea and Galilee. He's for the entire world. The entire world at that time was smaller than ours, but it was still the entire world. Early is what Jesus does, or when Jesus does it, when he, when he goes to the, to the River Jordan to be anointed publicly as the Messiah. And he rose from out of the water, and the Spirit descended as a dove, and there was a voice that came from heaven and said, not that one, not that one, not the Baptist, but this is my beloved son. Listen to him. That comes mighty early before he actually gets into action. And when he gets into action, what's the, one of the early things that the anointed, the Christos, that's what Christ means, by the way. It's like his last name, Jesus Christos. I've got Gary Boy. He's got 
the Redeemer anointed. That's what Jesus means. Joshua, the guy who saves. Christos, the anointed one. After he's Christos, hmm, what does Jesus do? He performs a miracle. He performs a miracle. And it wasn't to entertain people. It wasn't to, it wasn't to, to um, build a reputation. Look at me like, like last week. Remember that? You forgot my scarves? Huh? That's about the best I can do. Close as I can come to a miracle. But Jesus changes water into wine. Changes water into wine. And he didn't do it just to be a show-off, just to be the hit of the party. He did it as, what does it say? A simeon, a sign. You know what a sign does. It directs you to something. The changing of the water into wine directs people to Jesus as the Son of God and manifest God's glory. And many believed in him. If you have a miracle in your life, don't just say, wow. Attribute to the Lord Jesus and let it strengthen your faith. And what else is it? What else is early? Well, Luke chapter 4 isn't very deep into the, evan to the evangelist Luke's account of the life and death of Jesus. It's early. It's early. And what does it say he does? So this is important because it's his priorities. And a priority of Jesus is to preach, to preach, to talk about the kingdom of God, to talk about the kingdom of God. He had just come back from Capernaum, and he did a lot of preaching in the synagogues there. And he decides to go home and to preach there. My suspicion was he would think, well, that's a comfortable place to preach. I'll go there because everybody knows me and, and, and I'll, have a, I'll have a fine response. I'll have a fine response. And he goes and he preaches there. And just like a modern day preacher reads the text, instead of it being in a book, a hardback book, it's in a scroll. So it rolls the scroll and probably deliberately he goes to Isaiah chapter 61. And he talks about God's Christos, when he comes, will usher in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is wonderful things like making the blind see, making the crippled walk, maybe making those imprisoned released from their prison. And you can take that metaphorically. I know that each and every one of us here this morning is in some kind of prison. We're in some kind of prison. I'm not going to ask you what yours is. I'm not going to tell you what mine is. Maybe it's multiple prisons. Nothing else is the prison of sin and mortality. Hmm? We are sentenced to die, along with the other prisons that come with life. So Jesus preaches, and he preaches the text of Isaiah, and he expounds on it, and he tells the wonderful news of, of God's kingdom, which involves repentance for sin, of course, but a good and gracious, good and gracious God. Like in Nehemiah, the people wept when they heard the word of God. They wept because they were confronted with their sins. That's an important part of the word of God. It ain't all sweetness and light. Preachers will say things that you won't like to hear. But a certain level of maturity will say, yes, the shoe fits. I need to repent of that sin. But like the congregation in Nehemiah's time, Nehemiah said, quit crying, get up. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. Go home and have a feast. That's God's double-edged sword, his word. Hmm? Law, confrontation of your sin, and God's gospel. They go together. You need to take both. How else will you grow? And then Jesus, after he preaches the word, he says, amen. The congregation thinks the sermon is over, but he adds one more line. He says, today it's happening. The scripture has been fulfilled. Jesus doesn't just preach the word. He is the word. He is the, the power. He's the dynamite that affects repentance hmm, and the good stuff. Release from prison. Hmm. The joy of the Lord. Forgiveness. 
salvation. Lack of fear when this earthly life is over because you know you have eternal life. That all came early. Now the point of this retelling of Jesus' sermon is the reaction of the congregation. That's where you and I come in. What is your reaction when you hear something from the Word that you don't like? Hmm? What is your reaction when you come to church and it's the same old pastor? Hmm? Oh, it's pastor. His sermons are starting to sound all the same. I don't like the way he preaches down here. I wish he was up there. I wish they were shorter. I wish they were longer. That's what happened in the congregation at Nazareth. They knew Jesus. And he was too familiar. What a... Tra you know, Jesus has been here a long time. You've been coming a long time. I looked it up in the directory. 1935. You've been around for a long time. And Jesus has been here for those 80 years. And I think the temptation is for some of us to say, ah, oh, it's just Jesus. It's just the same old thing. Isn't there something more exciting? Isn't there something that <clears throat> can help me get rich or a little more entertaining? That's what happened. The first reaction of the listeners in Nazareth. They had had an ambiguity about Jesus. How can this be? It's Pastor Boy again. Why can he say anything different? How can this be? It's Jesus again. I've known him for 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, and it's the same old message. I can't. Isn't this Joseph's son? No, it's not. It's the person who fulfills all the word of God all those wonderful promises, all those confrontations, all those, I'll go back to the promises, those wonderful promises that he loves you so much there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not even your sins. And you've done some doozies. You're doing some doozies. And yet Jesus takes care of that. And then Jesus kind of confronts them and says, you know, when I was at Capernaum, people listened. They listened. And they said, thank you. And they said, thank you for the word. Thank you for giving us the law. Thank you for giving us the gospel. Hmm? And they had faith. They embraced me. The implication was, I don't see that here. Wouldn't it be sad if Jesus said that to us? Wouldn't it be sad, including myself, if Jesus this morning says, you know, I don't, I don't see any faith. I don't see any faith. I could do a lot more. When, that would be a good I, I am, huh? If, we could let, if we'd allow Jesus to do a lot more, to do a lot more, to have this place buzzing. When you got that, the new pastor, and he could take you to the next level, wouldn't it be tragic if you did that? The original congregation, Nazareth, they took offense at that. They took offense at that. Then they got angry from ambiguity to anger. What a tragedy if we resented what Jesus has to say to us, and not says to us, but be for us. So the best option is acceptance. And that takes humility on my part and on your part. When the word is read, when it's just Jesus again, Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, Bible class after Bible class, pastoral visit after pastoral visit, communion after communion, when it's just Jesus again, not to take offense because he's all the word, confrontation, judgment on sin, but forgiveness, forgiveness, and eternal life and to embrace him, to embrace him and says, give us more.
Come, Lord Jesus, be my guest. And let these gifts, I'm not talking about the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm talking about forgiveness, life, love, salvation, meaning, new start, parole out of prison, freedom from anxiety about death, all those, th the abortion, the, for the divorce, all, all, washed, all washed away, all clean, all clean, all that, more of that. Okay, give me more acceptance. Let's close with a prayer. Lord Jesus, we are tempted to get bored. We're tempted to dismiss you. We're attempting to look for something a little more flashy. But right now, send your Holy Spirit to accept, to open my heart to your presence right here this day in the Word and to always to see in you exactly what I need. Healing of my soul, new life, and the promise of heaven. In your precious name, I pray, we pray, amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting.